My name is Zach. I am joined by co-host and electron cloud meteorologist Andrew Robbins. Hello. Today we're joined by a very special guest, Dr. Luke Barnes. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the Sydney Institute for Astronomy. He has numerous published papers in the field of galaxy formation and on the fine-tuning of the universe for life. His book with Grant Lewis, A Fortunate Universe, is available on Amazon, Cambridge University Press, mostly pretty much wherever books are sold. Uh, we highly recommend it. Dr. Barnes, welcome. Thank you for having me. Today's discussion uh, is going to build off a little bit on the lecture that you gave last night on A Fortunate Universe. It's talking primarily about the fine-tuning um, of the universe for life. To briefly sketch out why this is interesting, in, uh, in contemporary philosophical debates, people have uh, constructed an argument for the existence of God, something along the lines of, the universe is fine-tuned for life. This is something that's really remarkable because there are features of the universe that are incredibly precise that... Um, with just small variations, life would not be possible. This is something that would be really surprising if God didn't exist, but is not so surprising if God didn't exist. So our focus is going to be primarily on what exactly this fine-tuning is uh, and understanding that phenomenon. Could you describe for us just very briefly what, what exactly physicists mean when they're talking about the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life? Well, firstly, when physicists talk about fine-tuning, they're using a little bit of jargon there. The, the picture to have in your head is, is a, someone dialing in on an old, old-timey radio at some exact uh, station they want to listen to. So what a physicist means by fine-tuned is that some uh, free parameter in their model, some number that they need to put in, um, needs a very precise value in order to explain something in particular. So fine-tuning for life just says... We have these numbers in physics, like how heavy is an electron and how strong uh, is gravity. And we need to give them a very precise value, even though we don't know ahead of time what they are, but they need to have a very precise value in order for the universe to support uh, anything like the complexity for life. There are some people that have confused fine-tuning with intelligent design. Uh, could you draw out and tease out some of the differences between those? So fine-tuning is just physics jargon. It's a way you test an idea. If it's, if it's sort of too flexible for its own good, then uh, it seems like it's not really predicting anything. So if you have a theory which you know, has this, this free dial in there that you can change the predictions according to what the dial says, and you can just tune in the right predictions, it seems like the theory was a bit too clever for its own good. So that's, that's all that fine-tuning means, and fine-tuning for life is just that idea applied to the statement, our universe supports life. So what exactly that might imply, philosophically or scientifically, is a completely different question. It's related, of course, and follows from, but that's not what the word fine-tuning means. Would you mind sketching for us perhaps one of the strongest examples of fine-tuning currently under debate today? So I think one of the best today is, is called the cosmological constant. The, uh, there is a form of energy in the universe which is causing its expansion to accelerate. What that does once the cosmological constant has taken over is cause uh, galaxy formation to shut down. Basically everything in the universe is too far away from everything else. So galaxies, as they try to form, they need to sort of grab things around them gravitationally. But if everything's too far away, then everything in the universe simply becomes isolated. So uh, if the cosmological constant were too large, then this would happen before any structure had formed and you wouldn't have any galaxies, you wouldn't have any structure at all. Uh, or if the cosmological constant was large and negative, the universe would simply recollapse before any structure forms. Okay. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty good example. There's a huge range that the, that particular number could have and only a very small subset allows the universe to create any kind of structure. Could you provide an example of maybe bad fine-tuning, maybe something that uh, was originally thought to be fine-tuned but isn't, or maybe something that in popular literature is claimed to be fine-tuned, but it's really just a misrepresentation? Yeah, so one of my most recent published papers actually is on a particular case about this. So it was claimed uh, as early as the 70s, the early 70s, that there was a particular fine-tuning relating to stars. In our universe, if you try to put two protons together into a nucleus, they won't stick to each other. You need something else in there. You need neutrons. Uh, it was claimed that if, you, if two protons could stick, then uh, nuclear reactions in stars would be way too fast. Stars effectively wouldn't be 
sort of slow nuclear reactors that could burn out over a very long time, but they would be essentially bombs. They, they, once a star ignited, they would just blow up. Um, it was suspected on other grounds, uh, actually there's a, an interesting comment in a footnote in a textbook about this, that actually that's not the way things would actually go, that the star would just become a bit cooler and a bit less dense at its centre, but you would still have uh, perfectly long-lived stars. So one of my most recent papers on what's the, the so-called diproton disaster uh, went into some modelling of this and actually showed that, yeah, it's, it's not an example of fine-tuning if you make it so pr two protons can stick, then uh, not much changes about the stars that we see around us. Okay. Last night in the lecture and also at the uh, end of your book, you surveyed a couple of responses to, to the fine-tuning. One that is particularly popular that, that I've heard myself is this idea that physicists are treating fine-tuning like it's some sort of remarkable phenomenon but it doesn't exactly seem surprising that we would see something that is fine-tuned for life. In other words, if these are the preconditions that are necessary for our existence, then we kind of have to observe them anyway. In other words, the only universe that can be observed is a fine-tuned universe. So wouldn't the probability of, of fine-tuning rocket up to 100%? So what that tells you is the probability of a fine-tuned universe given that life exists. And you know, fair enough. That's, that seems to be about one, maybe, modulo some other problems. Um, the problem is you should then ask, what's the probability that a life-permitting universe exists at all? Uh, and that doesn't seem to be explained unless you've got a very sort of strange idea about how the universe came about by the fact that we're here. Uh, unless you, there's some weird way in which our existence is connected to the universe as a whole, you, you don't want to say something like, the universe exists because we are here. So it seems like the cause, the causation there is all is entirely the wrong way around. So, for uh, uh, I think of the anthropic principle, the the statement that if if we exist, then we must ex observe a life permitting universe, as kind of a selection effect. So, in astronomy, you only ever see the brightest things in the sky because they have, they have to be bright to be seen in your telescope. But that fact alone won't explain why any particular thing is bright. So you can't say, why do I see that distant quasar over there? What, why is that quasar over there so bright? Could, well, because otherwise I wouldn't see it. That, that's not a good explanation. I see. One of the other responses has been to postulate the existence of multiple universes or uh, the multiverse hypothesis. Um, that's come under a lot of scrutiny. Uh, do you think that this is a successful way of explaining the, uh, the fine-tuning phenomenon? I think if it were true, we can we can all see a way in which that would, would give some sort of explanation there. You know, we ask a question like, why does anyone win? Why, why, you know, why does anyone win the lottery? And the answer is because lots of big people buy different tickets. So if it seems like life is the kind of thing that's unlikely, maybe there's lots of universes out there with lots of you know different varying properties, and you know, eventually, the only places where people will be asking why this universe, why do we see these constants around us, are the ones in which there's people to ask those questions. So I think if it's true, then it would explain something. Um, it could also uh, fail to explain what we see if it uh, makes false predictions about what's going on in our universe. And there's a worry about how we, you know, test the whole thing in the first place. The this this sort of central postulate of the theory, the central idea is, is a whole heap of other universes out beyond past what we can possibly see, and so we'll never see them. So we, there's a lot of people asking whether this is actually a scientific theory. There are two responses to the multiverse I'd like to discuss. First, you said that the multiverse potentially could raise some false uh, predictions. Last night in your lecture, you mentioned the popular Boltzmann brain. Uh, would you mind going over that um, and describing what exactly is a Boltzmann brain. So a Boltzmann brain is a different way of getting an observer. The way that our universe made observers is by first making all the sort of necessary structures and having having life form uh, on the surface of a planet. Uh, so it, there's, a, there's a long process there starting from galaxies and stars and supernovae and planets and all that kind of thing. In it's possible, well, in, in very many multiverses, there are uh, examples of multiverses in which 
the easiest way to make a person is not that way, not via a you know, very long process where you, you gradually get around to making life on a planet somewhere via a long process, but rather to simply have, a, have an observer kind of pop out of the chaos. You don't need to make an entire galaxy of order, you just need to make one brain and have that brain have some thoughts. The, the Boltzmann brain problem is, is then this, if you have your multiverse, you've got, to, you've got to answer the question, what kind of thing is a typical observer? And if a typical observer is not the kind of life form we find ourselves to be, but this kind of Boltzmann brain, this fluctuation observer, then it seems to have made a false prediction. So that's one uh, interesting way in which the idea could be wrong. I see. Another response uh, to this multiverse um, hypothesis is to say that let's assume that there is a multiverse. You still have to explain where these multiverses are coming from, so you would have to additionally postulate something to the effect of a multiverse generator. But in order for that generator, quote-unquote, to produce multiverses, it itself is going to have its own level of fine-tuning. Now, uh, My question is, last night you mentioned that the multiverse itself isn't even that much of a scientific hypothesis. Is this line of reasoning, is there any science behind it as well, uh, discussing this multiverse generator? So I mentioned last night that there are some ideas about how a multiverse generator could work, uh, what's called inflation, uh, the idea that in the earlier stages of the universe it, it, uh, its expansion was exponential, it, it, it was very, very rapid. If that's true, then uh, it would explain some things about our universe, and so people have tried to make physical models of how we might actually achieve inflation, how inflation might have actually happened, according to some set of, uh, you know, some form of energy that makes the universe do that, for example. So it's claimed that in many of these models, many of these ideas, there will be a multiverse that comes out naturally. It will, or it will sort of naturally produce sort of bubbles of, of universes in a background of inflating space. So I think it's, ne it's, it's pretty much necessary that a, a multiverse theory needs some sort of generator if you have to postulate each individual universe in your multiverse sort of independently then you're going to be in a lot of trouble with something like Occam's razor um, but if you can make all the multiverses come out of a single generator then it, you have least unity in your idea at that level it, it might even be a simple idea and if it follows from physics then it, it's at least got that going for it there are all these worries about testing it but uh, there are physical theories which we can imagine that uh, that would generate a multiverse. The next issue that we'd like to discuss is what is popularly called the normalization problem of fine-tuning. And I'd like to give it to Andrew to, to sort of sketch out this problem for us. So to get an idea of what we mean about this, um, let's imagine a sharpshooter who is firing at a target that is one meter in diameter, and he's... 100 meters away from the target. If he hits the bullseye of the target, you know, within a millimeter or so of the target, we would say this is fine-tuned. The distance that he was from the target compared to the distance he was away from the target is very small, so he had very little room for error. On the other hand, if this same sharpshooter hit the same bullseye but was only 10 meters away, now it's less fine-tuned because that one millimeter away from the center of the bullseye is larger compared to the 10, me the 10 meters away that he was um, than that ratio was when he was 100 meters away. On the other hand, if he's a kilometer away from the target and he hits that bullseye within a millimeter, now it's very, very fine-tuned because a millimeter is very small compared to the kilometer away that he was. Now, the d difficulty comes if we imagine the sharpshooter being an infinite distance away from the bullseye. So if he's an infinite distance away, and he shoots and he hits the bullseye within a millimeter of it, we'd say, okay, we, at, intuitively that seems like it's pretty fine-tuned. But now, if he does the same thing, he's an inf infinite distance away, and he lands within a meter of the bullseye, is that any less fine-tuned? If you're thinking about it in terms of a 
ratio, the distance from the bullseye to the distance that the shooter is away from the bullseye, uh, those ratios are the same. An infinite distance, any number over an infinite distance is basically zero. So they're infinitely fine-tuned no matter how close or far away he is from the bullseye. In fact, if he fires and his bullet lands 100 billion kilometers away from the bullseye, it's just as fine-tuned as if he had shot and landed within a millimeter of the bullseye. So this could be called like a coarse tuning objection. The idea is if we don't have a good range over which to look at these parameters, then we wind up um, in the situation where over an infinite range, no matter how finely or coarsely tuned something is, no matter how big or small the range of, of life permitting values is, the fine tuning is basically the same. The, mathematically, the level of fine tuning is the same. So the question is, how do we deal with this type of an objection, you know, kind of a statistical mathematical objection to these probabilities that we're talking about? So I think this is actually quite a familiar problem when we go to test any physical theory, because we want to be able to say, if, if my idea about the universe is right, if my theory was correct, how likely is it that I would see the data I collected in the lab yesterday? And so if you've got an, a large set of possibilities and then a small set of um, actual outcomes, then you know it seems like th th there's a small, possibility, small probability there. So uh, how do we handle infinities in this sort of case? Well, we need to find some way of limiting the set of possibilities so we can actually you know, deal with this problem. I, I think in, in testing any theory with these free parameters in them, with a number that we can change, we need to deal with this po possibility, right? Asking what's the probability that life will come out if my theory is true is just like asking any other scientific question of a theory, like what, what is the probability that uh, there would be atoms or galaxies or something like that. So it's that kind of problem for me. It's something that we just need to sort of sort out via our physical theory. I don't think there's anything particularly vexing about it. The way we do it in the actual models that we have is that they, the models themselves, the theories themselves, limit the range of these parameters. So for any, any parameter that has, so for example, I've talked about the masses, there's a finite range there. You can't be negative, a negative mass doesn't make sense in our models. And on the upper limit, our theories run out. They cease to be self-consistent above something which is called the Planck mass, which is a very large mass <laughs> compared to any of the particles in our universe, but it's still quite quite finite. If, if a particle had a mass greater than the Planck mass, we would need to, to take gravity into account on a quantum level, and we don't yet have a theory that can do that. So these... These sorts of problems are interesting. I just think that uh, physicists have met them before and handled them. So uh, we can find a way of finding a reasonable set of finite possibilities that give us the probabilities we're interested in. So it sounds like basically what you're saying is that there's sort of an epistemological range here. There's a range where we can understand, like where we have theories that, that are valid. And in that range, we can look at we can look at what would happen if we change the parameters. Anything outside of that, we don't even really have theories that can deal with, so we can only we can only look at some range anyway. And so within this range that we can look at, we know a very small region is life permitting. Is that basically the Yeah, idea? That's, that's basically it. Although when we say, you know, an, an epistemic range, uh, it's not just that we don't know what the theory predicts above the Planck mass or outside of. It's that the, the theory is... is predicting its own inconsistency. It's, mm -hmm. it's stronger than just, this is a really hard problem, we haven't solved it yet. The theories we have don't tell us what's going on out there, so we would need a new theory. One more sort of uh, question regarding the, the philosophical implications. I've seen a little bit of a contradiction sometimes, or, or to me it seems like a contradiction. I've heard some uh, scientifically minded Christians make arguments along the lines of, when you look at the fundamental laws of nature, they're so simple and so beautiful and so elegant that they seem to be written by a designer. But it seems to me that the fine tuning argument says, these constants and quantities are so messy and so precise that it would take an intelligent mind 
to fine tune them precisely to where to where they need to be. Is this a legitimate um, contradiction, or are those held in tension, or am I just completely missing missing the point? I don't think so. I don't think fine tuning tells us that the universe is is messy. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing about you know the universe is a complicated place, and at some level. The, our physics is going to have to be able to handle that, that complication. The interesting thing is that it comes in the level of the outcomes of the laws. Uh, the laws themselves that we discover underneath the, the phenomena of nature are remarkably simple laws. You can write down the, the standard model of cosmology on a single sheet of paper and the standard model of particle physics on a single sheet of paper. The interesting thing then is that the, the free parameters in those models, the numbers we need to put in, uh, need to be in a very small range. So the, f the fact that the ultimate laws are simple means that we can sort of check what would happen if these numbers were different, and that leads us to fine-tuning. So it's not that the parameters are, are messy, they just need to be quite precise. Okay. Our last question here is just for fun. You're on a boat and it crashes, you're now stranded on a deserted island, but you get to bring with you your favorite element. Which is your favorite element that you would have with you on a deserted island? <laughs> well, I think there's a pretty obvious answer here, and that's oxygen. <laughs> uh, without that, I don't think I'm um, lasting very long. Uh, assuming that the the you know the desert island had some oxygen of its own there mm -hmm. waiting for me, um, I would look around for the kind of uh, element that you could build a boat out of. <laughs> uh, nothing particularly comes to mind. I guess like a massive pile of sodium just to throw chunks of it into the ocean and watch it blow up. That would be entertaining <laughs> for me while I waited. Um, or just gold. So if anyone finds me, I'll at least be able to buy my way off the island. Yeah, gold. Yeah, just a massive gold. Let's go with that. Okay.